Good morning, everybody. We're all in our place with bright, shiny faces. You always got to love the first day of class or Bible study. Everybody's so eager and excited and smiling. And by the end, everybody's like, <laughs> uh, Did everybody get their coffee they wanted? Okay. All right, then why don't we get started with prayer? That's the way to begin anything, right? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. From the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. And you shall bind them as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Good and loving God, we praise you and we thank you for your many blessings, especially for revealing to us that you are the one true God. We begin this Bible study today. The only reason we really should begin a Bible study is to come to know you better. We ask you to open up our hearts and minds to understand how you have revealed yourselves in the Holy Torah. We ask you to help us to understand and to gain the wisdom that you would have us learn. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So we had some technology problems this morning, so that's why you have empty folders. <laughs> so now there's handouts. So I ask you to take in this order. So the order they're coming around. Take one, Pastor. I'm gonna, now I'm going to just have to do it this way because they, they have to go in order in their books. In other words, people will get confused. But thank you, Susan. That goes in first. This goes in second. There you go, just like that. <laughs> Kathy wanted me to have, oh, I, all right, thank you. I know what those are, yeah. This goes in third. Yep, yeah, thank you. This goes in fourth. And this goes in last. I'm sorry. Oh, more folders. Yeah. Hi, Tim. You're good. You're fine. You're fine. So you should have five pages. And the, the first one is the one that has, looks like a cover page. And the last one is the one that says Pontifical Biblical Commission or something like that. Who's the last table? How's this working? You guys are the last table? Okay. Can you just collect all the extras and keep them in separate piles? Thank you. And I'll get them afterwards. Next, we're going to pass out scissors and glue. <laughs> no eating the paste. <laughs> oh. And I'm sorry, they're not mimeograph copies. Remember mimeographs? <laughs> you could sniff them and... <laughs> uh-huh, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Wow, everybody follows directions very well. Yeah, well, that's appropriate. 
Okay. Are we nearly finished? It looks like we're nearly finished. Okay, then I'm going to start talking a little bit while you're finishing up that. So what I want to do today is kind of give us a little bit of background again. Many of you have heard me talk at the beginning of a Bible study already about how Catholics understand Scripture. We'll do a quick review of that. because That's going to be important as we get into the first chapters of Genesis. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about why we're looking at the Old Testament at all. What does, it have to, what does it have to do with us who are disciples of Jesus? We're going to talk a little bit about the Pentateuch Torah in general. And then we'll finish up and we'll talk about what we do after today. Okay. So the first thing is divine inspiration versus human. Oh, by the way, that's what we're studying, Torah. It's interesting, you read Torah, you read in Hebrew right to left. So this is the t, the u, uh, the er, and the uh. <laughs> and then this is what we just read. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You might be more familiar with, oh, that messed up. How did that happen? Oh, well, I was supposed to say Pentateuch up there. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. So something happened to that slide, sorry. Okay, so divine inspiration versus human authorship. So we've talked about before that the Holy Spirit inspired the human authors. That's what we talk about. Where do these words come from that we call the scriptures? The Holy Spirit inspired human authors to write certain things. The, hum the Holy Spirit did not give dictation. It wasn't like, in the beginning, comma, the Holy, no. The Holy Spirit inspired the words. Okay, so we believe in divine inspiration, but human authorship. So it's divine and human working together. We also talk about Bible scholarship. And with Bible scholarship, one of the handouts I gave you, um, the one that's in the last page, says history of Catholic Bible scholarship in the 19th and 20th centuries. You see that page? It's the last page in the, uh, in the booklet. Human author, uh, the history of Catholic Bible scholarship in the 19th, 20th centuries, right? Is that the last page? Everybody's got that? Okay. So that's something you can go back and look at on your own. It just might help you understand how the Catholic Church moved from being somebody who didn't talk too much about the scriptures to becoming the world leaders in Christianity of understanding the Holy Scriptures. So that's uh, something you can read on your own. I also have here some copies of a document called The Interpretation of the Bible in the Church. This is in 1993. The Pontifical Biblical Commission, so that's like the highest biblical experts in the Catholic Church, produced this document in 1993 um, on everything we need to know about how to understand the scriptures, where the scriptures come from, how we read them through the lens of the church, everything in there. It's 50 pages, so I didn't print a copy for everybody because I know the reality is not everybody's going to read 50 pages, but I do have several copies up here. So afterwards, if you want a copy of that and you want to read it, um, just come up here and, and ask me for one. Uh, it's, it's, it's excellent. It has everything you need to know about understanding scriptures. So we have Bible scholarship. Fundamentalism versus the historical critical method. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but there's a difference between reading the Bible and expecting it to be uh, literally word for word in every sense that we understand those words today versus actually looking at the text, comparing it against other writings of the times to understand literary formulas, understanding it in the context of the whole scripture, looking at different versions. So let's say we find a manuscript. Uh, some of you were just in Israel and you went to the shrine of the book and we saw excerpts of Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, those were found, those were written hundreds of years before Jesus, but they were found over a thousand years after Jesus. We compare that with other versions of the same text that we know to see if there are similarities or differences. So there's all these different ways that scripture scholars look at a text to try and understand. So if we say we're writing about George Washington and I'm writing a book and 10 years from now somebody looks at my book, well, they look at other books that are written about George Washington. 
to compare those to each other to see, okay, what is this guy saying? What is that guy saying? What's he, what's he basing this on? That's the same thing Bible scholars do. They look at different versions from different eras in time and look and see different languages. This was, this was originally written in Greek. This is what it appears to say in Greek, but it was translated into Latin, and it says this, and it's slightly different than this. So what does this help us understand about these scriptures? So there's all different kinds of things involved in Bible scholarship. Um, and the historical critical method versus fundamentalism. Translation issues, I know we talked about this before, that when you translate from one language into the other, very often you can't translate word for word. So, for example, if I would say, buenos dias, any Spanish speakers here, what does that mean? Literally, what does it mean? It means good days, in the plural, actually. Buenos dias, good days. But how does every person who speaks Spanish mean that? Good morning. So, you can see just translating that simple phrase, two words, you can translate it literally, or you can translate it idiomatically or figuratively, the way people actually use the phrase. And our... Um, in our, um, our prayers at Mass, we had in 2010, we had a new translation of the Mass came out. One of the reasons why is because when it was translated in 1969, or it started in 69, finished in 74, when they started translating those, uh, the texts of the Mass, they translated them more idiomatically and not literally. So, for example, for 40 years in the church, we said, the Lord be with you, and we said, and also with you, Okay. But the original Latin text doesn't say, and also with you. It says, et cum spiritu tuo, which literally means, and with your spirit. So the new translation is giving us an, a word-for-word -word translation of the Latin text rather than an idiomatic translation that we had for 40 years. So there's two different ways of translating. So translations become an issue when you're looking at scriptures. We were just um, at the uh, Church of Peter's Primacy in, um, in Israel. And the, um, this is where Jesus asks Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, I love you. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And he says, yes, I love you. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, it seems like he's asking the same question three times and getting the same answer three times because that's in English. If you look back at the original Greek text, it's not at all what's happening. In the original Greek text, Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me with a self-sacrificing love? And Peter says, well, of course I phileos you. I love you like a brother. Jesus says again, Peter, do you agape me? Peter says, well, of course I phileos you. And the third time says, Jesus changes his question because he knows Peter's not ready to answer what he wants him to answer. Peter, do you phileos me? And Peter says, yes, I phileos you. That completely gets lost in our English translation because we only have one word for agape and philios, and that's love. So translation, so sometimes you're, we're going to get caught up on something in the English translation, but we have to stop and think, that's an English translation. If we really want to understand the text, we have to kind of go back and look at the original language of the text, and is there a nuance there that gets lost in English? Now, that's what the Bible scholars do, <laughs> but that's all part of this. Translation is sometimes an issue. Different versions of the same text in English. Most of us probably have a New American Bible. Okay? Some of us have, might have the RSV, Revised Standard Version. Some of us might have the Jerusalem Bible. All three of those are slightly different translations from the original text. Some emphasizing more of the idiomatic or the conversational. Some more technical and word for word. New American tries to straddle the middle. That's what we use at Mass, the New American Bible. So it's, um, so translations become an issue when understanding a text. And then finally, scripture study and praying with the scriptures. As I said in our prayer this morning, we were talking to the Lord. It's not ultimately about just getting a bunch of head knowledge. It's about how does this help us to, because the whole purpose of scriptures, how does this help us to know Christ? That's the whole point. How does this help us to know the Lord? And so praying with the scriptures is a really important thing. And one of the things I'm hoping to do more of in this Bible study than we did the last time is do some more Lectio Divina, more praying with the scriptures, so we can see how to do that more um, as Catholic Christians. Any questions on that? Like I said, for those of you who've done the Bible study with me before, you've heard all of this before. This is hopefully review. Okay, then moving on. So why study the Old Testament? The Old Testament is 
stories about God and his relationship with people. And so we, the more we understand the Old Testament scriptures, the more we understand God's relationship with us. Interesting thing is a good part of the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, is shared by every Christian. So it's something that unifies us across denominational boundaries. It's also shared by most people who claim the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We call them usually Jewish people. And to a large extent, it's shared by Muslim people. And so the Old Testament, a lot of the Old Testament is shared, and it can be a way of unifying people across religious boundaries, religious divisions between Christianity, within Christianity, with our Jewish friends and with our Muslim friends. The, um, we'll talk more in a specific moment, but it helps us bond in interreligious dialogue. It helps us in ecumenical conversation with Protestants and Orthodox as well. Um, it's also a good thing because if one wants to understand salvation history, you can't understand salvation history if you begin with Matthew chapter 1. There's a whole lot of salvation history that occurs before that. Doesn't mean that we can't know Christ and we can't know salvation without reading the Old Testament, but so much of the New Testament is rooted in the Old Testament. Jesus is constantly quoting people from the Old Testament. St. Paul is constantly quoting them. And so, so much of the New Testament makes more sense if we understand the Old Testament. So if Matthew starts talking about Jesus as the new Moses, well, it sure helps a whole lot if we have an idea who the old Moses was, um, because how, otherwise we're going to miss Matthew's point. Um, or if Jesus says, um, uh, you heard the prophet say, or you've heard it said that such and such, but I say this and this. Well, where did we hear that said? If we never looked at the Old Testament, we would have no idea what, what was said and what context it was said and how it was said and what people understood then to understand what Jesus is trying to tell them in his time. So studying the Old Testament really helps us understand the New Testament better. There are stories. It's important to our faith because the two sources of God's self-revelation are the sacred scripture and the sacred tradition. That consistent teaching of the apostles handed down for 2,000 years, that's what we call sacred tradition. And the sacred scriptures, not just the New Testament. God reveals himself in the Old Testament too. So if we really want to know God, we have to take advantage of everything he offers us to tell us about himself, not just the things that came after December 25th, year zero. That was a little joke. Um, the Council of Fathers of Vatican II wrote, uh, one of the four major documents of the Council is the document Dei Verbum, the document on divine revelation. That's how important the bishops, the 2,000 plus bishops from all over the world in the early 1960s felt divine revelation was. It was one of the four major documents. There were 16 documents in all, but four major ones. And one of them was on divine revelation. It talks a lot about how we understand the sacred scriptures. They said the sacred scriptures contain the word of God. And since they are inspired, they really are the word of God. They're not just the words about God. They're not just the words that God would say about himself if we asked him. They are indeed the word of God as if God himself were speaking words to us. And so the study of the sacred page is, as it were, the soul of sacred theology. One cannot study God without an awareness of the sacred scriptures. That's that quote right there. Since they are inspired, they really are the word of God. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, God communicates himself to us gradually. He prepares us to welcome by stages the supernatural revelation that is to culminate in the person and the mission of the incarnate word, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I love this idea that God communicates himself to us gradually. My favorite analogy of that is, uh, how many of you in here have raised a child? <laughs> Just about everybody, okay? Can you give a child a steak dinner the day after he's born? Well, you can if you want to kill the child, right? Yeah, but no. They're not, ready. They're not ready for that. They have to start with milk, and then they can move into that baby food stuff, and then they can move into softer foods, and they can work into more substantial foods, right? You have to go gradually as the child is ready to receive that. That's how God feeds us. He feeds us gradually because he knows we can't take it all at once. Could you imagine if Moses on Mount Sinai 
Jesus had just appeared to him and said, well, here I am. Moses would have had no idea what to do with that. Moses would have had, let alone the rest of the Israelites. So God has to reveal himself to us gradually. And so it's thousands of years of interaction with human beings before Jesus comes, the fullness of the revelation. And we're still 2,000 years later still trying to figure out what all that meant. That Jesus, the fullness of God's revelation, came among us. So God gives us this little by little. That's why the Old Testament is so important. Because you can't just jump into Matthew 1 and understand what's going on. You've got to understand what's come before to help you understand. So it's little by little God reveals himself. And we're going to see it so very, very clearly as we look at Torah. We're going to see how God, even within those first five books of what we call the Bible, is a gradual God self-revelation. Because Adam and Eve weren't ready for it all yet. And then, of course, this wonderful line from St. Paul's letter, second letter to St. Timothy. All scripture, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for refutation. Refutation means shooting down false teachings, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Righteousness, being obedient to God's will. All scripture is useful for that. And so don't we just, we don't ignore the first 46 books of the Bible because that's all helpful for us, as St. Paul tells us, and, and coming to know God and to coming to understand how he wants us to live, how he wants us to interact with each other. Um, it's all so very important. And remember, one of the last things I always like to say is that, remember we're studying the word of God. The word of God is not a what. The word of God ultimately is a who. So every word, lowercase w, that we study helps us grow closer to the big W word, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the word of God is not a what, it's a who. With me so far? Like I said, this is probably all stuff you already know, and that's good. I'm glad. Um, the Old Testament is significant in its own right, helps us to know God in nature and in his words and decrees. It's not really correct to say the Old Testament are the Hebrew scriptures. Because if you mean by the Hebrew scriptures that they were originally written in Hebrew, that's not entirely true. Most of them were written originally in Hebrew, but some of them were originally written in Greek. So it's not really correct to call them the Hebrew scriptures. It's also not, if you mean by that, that they belong to only the Hebrew people. Well, that's not true either, because most of us here are not Hebrew people. St. Saint Saint John Paul called us spiritual Semites, but we're not Hebrew people. And there are scriptures too. So it's really not the best term to call them the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, let's see. I told you that one already. Um, as I mentioned briefly, there's an inseparable relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. St. Augustine, who I always argue is probably the greatest theologian of the first thousand years of the church, said God wisely arranged the New Testament hidden in the Old Testament. So in studying the Old Testament, you're going to see things point that the New Testament points back to. But also that the Old Testament is made known in the New Testament. So things that happen in the Old Testament, we fully understand better in the light of the New Testament. So they really feed each other. Knowing the Old Testament helps us understand the New Testament. Knowing the New Testament helps us understand the Old Testament. They really do feed each other. The um, God promised that Elijah would return before the Messiah. Who's the Messiah? Jesus. Who was the Elijah who came before him? John the Baptist. That doesn't make any sense if you don't understand Elijah and God's promise that Elijah will return before the Messiah came. So you can see in the Old Testament is a prefiguring of what's going to happen. And in the New Testament, you see the fulfillment of what was promised in the Old Testament. See that? They really do work together. St. John says, we've seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was made visible to us. And that's in the first letter of St. John. The, the, the eternal life that was with the Father from the beginning and was made visible to us. So the principal purpose of the old covenant, which is another word for testament, was to prepare for the coming of Christ. That's in Dei Verbum, that document from Vatican II. It's in the light of the events of Easter, 
that the author of the New Testament reads the sacred scriptures of the Old Testament. So it's once we see Jesus die and rise that so much of what was promised before. The book of Isaiah, we cannot understand the book of Isaiah at all if we don't understand how it relates to Christ. Because everything that's in Isaiah points to the coming of Christ, points to his suffering and death. And so you, you really don't understand all of that and how it fits into salvation history if you don't know Isaiah and, if you, don't, and, and you can't understand how it's fulfilled if you, if you don't have this verse. And so they really do feed each other back and forth. Um, somebody counted, wasn't me, <laughs> somebody counted some 300, 300 direct references in the New Testament from the Old Testament. 300 direct references in the New Testament. And an additional 1,000 or more indirect references. So when the prophet said this, or the prophet said that, or as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be. I mean, on and on and on. Direct references, indirect references, all over the place in the New Testament to the Old Testament. Jesus himself quotes the Old Testament in, in his teaching all the time. Um, the Transfiguration, who's he shown with? On Mount Tabor? Moses and Elijah. Moses represents the law, also known as Torah. Elijah represents the prophets. So who does he choose to appear with? He doesn't choose to appear with St. John the Baptist, who's already dead, and his father, who's probably already dead, St. Joseph, his foster father. He chooses to appear with Moses and Elijah because he's making a statement. I'm the fulfillment of these guys. But you can't understand what that means for me to be the fulfillment of these guys unless you understand these guys. And his audience did. They understood Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. So we have to, if we want to fully understand who Jesus is, we have to understand those guys too. The, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, this must not make us forget that the Old Testament retains its own intrinsic value as a revelation reaffirmed by our Lord himself. So that means that not only because it points to the New Testament, but in itself, the Old Testament is important. One of my favorite passages in the Old Testament is when God says, David has, I love David because he has the mind of God. David has the mind of God. Now that may sound, oh, that's great. David's a great big hero in Israel, right? What did David do? He lusted after his neighbor's wife, had him killed, and then took her as his own. Does that sound like somebody has the mind of God? But he does, because what does David do once he realizes what he's done? He repents. And that's why he has the mind of God. He has the wisdom to know when he was wrong and to repent. That lesson doesn't necessarily have to point to anything about Jesus. <laughs> it's a lesson in its own. We need to understand more about God from that brief passage, not because it points to Jesus, but because it tells us about who God the Father is. And so the, church, the, the bishops of the church tell us that Old Testament has its own value, not just in pointing forward, which of course is extreme value, but in its own right, it tells us the mind of God. The Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, that tells us the mind of God. That's how he wants us to love him and how he wants us to love each other. Don't do these things. Even if Jesus had never commented on them, they would still have their own value. Church fathers throughout the history of the church have done the same thing. Uh, Father Origen in the third century said, Christ's words are not only those which he spoke when he became flesh, for before that time, Christ, the word of God, was in Moses and the prophets, and their words too were filled with the Holy Spirit. St. Augustine, again, the 5th century, scriptures, in fact, in any passage you, choose, you care to choose, sing of Christ, provided we have the ears capable of picking out the tune. The Lord opened the minds of the apostles so they understood the scriptures, that he will open our minds too, is our prayer. The Old Testament also gives us the story of the history of Israel now, obviously, the political history from living in Palestine to going down to Egypt to the 12 tribes resettling to a nation growing to division in that nation to being in exile in Assyria and Babylon to the return to Palestine to the Greek and Roman conquest. All of that's in the Old Testament. So we know all that history, the political history of Israel. But it's also the spiritual history of people coming to know God. 
And we're going to see that very clearly in these five books we're going to study. To people coming to know God, to being rescued by God, to God establishing his people, to his people abandoning him, to God restoring them, to his people longing for the Messiah, to God visiting and redeeming his people. That's all in the Old Testament. Sometimes people find it helpful, I'm one of those people, to kind of have a timeline of how these things are happening in the Old Testament. So remember, this is all BC, okay? So that's why the numbers are getting smaller. It's sometimes hard to follow that because like, so he was born in 700, but he died in 650. <laughs> it's the opposite way we tend to think in the 21st century, right? So the numbers get smaller as you go forward. So the period of the patriarchs, we're talking about um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. That's 1800 BC to 1300 BC. It was interesting. I saw this compared against an uh, anthropological timeline. I think they called that the Bronze Age. When I think of things like the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, you know, the Stone Age, I think like way ancient. These things are happening during the Bronze Age. So it is old. It's really old, but it kind of helps you get a better global picture of what's going on. This, this goes way back. We're talking 4,000 years ago. So 1800, 1300, the period of the patriarchs. Um, most people are going to date the Exodus somewhere between 1300 and 1250 BC. The period of the judges. So if you remember after they settled in the, in the promised land, they don't have a king right away. They have judges. So you have people like um, um, Samson and you have people like Gideon and some of these other folks. That's in the period of the judges, 1250 to 1000. 1000 is the date we usually place David coming to the throne. Well, or Saul coming to the throne, depending. Um, so 1000 to 722 is the period of the kingdom, and it says, perhaps it says S kingdoms, because the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom split. Southern kingdom and northern kingdom split. Um, 722 to 539 is the period of the exiles. So there's the Assyrian exile that happens mostly in the north, and then there's the Babylonian exile, the Babylonian captivity. It happens mostly in the south. So that starts in 722. They return from, from exile in 539. There's that period of self-rule, um, 539 to 332. That's where you have Ezra and Nehemiah. Then you have Alexander the Great in 332, conquering this land um, at 332 BC. So because again, it puts it in a historical bigger picture when you think about Alexander the Great conquering the Mediterranean area. That's the Greek conquest, 175. The Maccabees kicked the Greeks out of town in, in this period, 175. And there's like Maccabean rule after that until 63 uh, BC when the Romans take over the middle uh, that, that whole Mediterranean area. And I put to the birth of, birth of Christ because we're talking about the Old Testament. So, so that, that's where the Old Testament ends is with the birth of Jesus. So, so you can kind of have a, a rough idea of the timeline of when these things are happening. We're concentrating on these two periods right here, 1800 and a little bit before that, to 1250 when the um, Israelites are settling in the promised land after, at the end of the Exodus. So in this Pentateuch, this Torah, we're focusing on these two time periods, okay? Questions on that? When we talked about passion and resurrection narratives last year, one of the things we talked about was how these actual writings develop. And it's just good to keep an eye, uh, an, ear, an eye open for this again. All of this starts with oral tradition. All of this starts with stories being passed down generation to generation. And I always want to remind people, if I want to look up today what year George Washington was born, and what Martha Washington's maiden name was, and I don't know that information, what am I gonna do? Look it up, right? <laughs> You're gonna look it up. Yeah, so I'm gonna go to Wikipedia, or I'm gonna go to any number of resources online, or I'm gonna go to, you know, 25 years ago, most of us have been going to a library to get that information, but they didn't have libraries, they didn't have an internet. The only way details and stories were kept alive is by word of mouth. And so they had to be good storytellers because they had to be able to pass down these details. Um, Do you ever see the movie Roots? 
So Kunta comes, Kunta Kinte comes from Africa. His daughter is Kizzy, and he teaches her some of the things from back in Africa, right? And then Kizzy has her son, George, Chicken George, and she teaches him some of the things that her father taught her, not all of them, but some of the things. And then Chicken George teaches his son, who teaches his grandson. And so with every generation, a few of the details got lost a little bit. But there were some things that were so important that they passed them on. And that's how oral tradition works. And the more you have to remember, the more you, you drill it into people. You drill it into your children and your grandchildren. All these important details of the family's history. That's how the scriptures work. It was oral tradition until somebody got around to writing. The early writings were not the complete books we have today. So it wasn't like someday somebody sat down one day and wrote Genesis from start to finish and said, here it is, everybody have it, have it now. Stories are being written down by people who had money, by people who had the time. Certain things are being written down. Most of this comes to us after the exile. So remember we talked about the exilic period, 722 to 539, after they come back from Israel, or come back to Israel from Babylon in the early 6th century BC, people have start to write down things. They start to codify laws. They start to um, fill out the stories. So the story of Moses, the story of, of, of Abraham offering sacrifice, the story of Noah offering sacrifice. A lot of these things get written down in a more complete form after they come back from the exile. So look at the, the time period. You're talking about over a thousand years from when some of these things happened. Okay? Some of them were fragments that they put together in a more cohesive unit, but a lot of it was just oral tradition being passed down, being passed down, being passed down. And who's guiding the whole process? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is guiding this whole process. Remember, we said this is human authorship, but divine inspiration. Okay? So do you think the Holy Spirit cares about what gets put on the page? Of course, right? So the Holy Spirit is guiding this process. And then finally, after the exile, you have these things on scrolls. So we don't have, of course, I don't have one. You don't have something like this. This is called a codex, okay? A bunch of pieces of paper with a binding, okay? But they have is scrolls. And scrolls are expensive because scrolls are not written on paper like this usually. They're written on vellum, animal hides, maybe papyrus. Both are expensive and everything has to be done by hand. So if I'm going to have um, J9, <laughs> Janine, employ her to write the copy, a hand copy of the scriptures, that's going to be her whole livelihood. So somebody's got to provide for her. So she better have a rich patron to provide a love, a living for her so that she can take time to hand write this book of Isaiah, to hand write all these things. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a long, long time before we have anything that looks like a codex that has all of these in there at the same time. And then of course, somebody has to decide what's getting in and what's not, what's not getting in and, and which version is getting in and which version is not getting in. And so that we'll, we'll get to that in a bit too. So when we start talking about specifically about Pentateuch, Pentateuch is a Greek word that means the five containers. Okay? So you see penta, that's five, and the five containers. So each of these containers contains truths, self-revelation about God. And so that's the word they use is the five containers in Greek. Um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Torah, which is the Hebrew word, which is this, T, uh, or, uh, is the teaching. Okay, it literally means the teaching. But almost every person you ask who's going to say, what does Torah mean? Means the law. Okay, this is, um, and we don't necessarily mean just a series of laws, like if you open up the code of canon law or you open up civil codes of law. What they're talking about here is the law, the rule, the regulation, the, 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 the way we live as God's people. Okay? So that concept of the word law is more than just what we think of. There's a law that says you can't cross a double yellow line to pass somebody. Right? This is more like um, the, 
the rule of life, the way that we live as God's chosen people. That's more that concept of the word law than just the way we tend to think of laws, okay? Um, so that's the, the Greek way we look at it. That's the, the Hebrew way we look at it. Um, so who wrote this stuff? Well, traditionally, and if you look in old Bibles, they will always say Moses, the lawgiver, is the one who wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay? Um, that's the human author under the divine inspiration. This is interesting, too. So there's a lot of missing letters there, and there's a reason for that. So who was the one that inspired? God. Okay? Traditional, very orthodox, very reverent adherers of the religion of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would never even write the word God because they consider that disrespectful to the holy name of the Lord. So they would write G-D. Okay? Well, we'll see in Exodus, God gives his full name. Again, they wouldn't write that out either, but it's Y-H-W-H. Okay? That's God's proper first name. So just like all of our parents had a first name, but we don't call our parents by their first name, this is God's first name, and we don't call him by his first name either. So usually in the scriptures, in the, in the Pentateuch, you're going to see either, well, I forgot one word up there, but I, well, translation, Elohim. Elohim means literally God. Okay, so let's say, for example, um, I know Helen's name is Helen, but I refer to her as dentist. Okay, dentist isn't her name. Helen's her name. God is not his, Elohim is not his name. That's like his job description. His name is YHWH. Sometimes, so and sometimes in the, in the passages we're going to read, we're going to hear him referred to as God, which is Elohim. Sometimes we're going to hear him called, and most of them we're going to hear him called, the Lord. And Lord's going to be in capital letters. Lord in Hebrew is the word Adonai. Again, that's like a title of respect. So instead of calling Helen Helen or calling Helen dentist, I'm calling Helen doctor. Okay. So referring to the Lord, referring to Adonai, is like calling him his title of respect. Because again, you can't call him this. Because that's his first name. And we don't go around calling God by his first name. In fact, some of you might have noticed in church a few years ago, a couple of our hymns changed. Uh, we used to sing, um, Yahweh, I know you are near. Remember that song? Now it's, oh Lord, I know you are near. Because the bishop said, hey, we shouldn't go around calling him by his first name. We should have more respect for his name that way. So the Jewish people would either write something like that, Y-H dash dash, because everybody knows that means W-H. Or they'll, or they'll just change the word altogether to Adonai. Or change it altogether to Elohim. By the way, interesting thing, Elohim is plural. Any word in Hebrew that ends in I-M is plural. That's like our S in English. We put an S on the end of words, show plural. I-M, the letters I-M at the end make it plural. So how about that? Even the Jews know that God is in the plural. Hmm. But that's called the four letters, the tetragrammaton. So you'll see Y-H-W-H almost never. You'll see an abbreviation with missing letters, but that's what you know it means. Or you'll see this. Or you'll see Adonai, or in English, we'll have the Lord, and the Lord's always in capital letters. Because not, they're not, the original text doesn't actually say the Lord. It wants you to read, when you see the Lord, it wants you to think Yahweh. That's what it wants you to think. That's why it's in capital letters, because it's not the Lord, capital L, lowercase O-R-D, because it's a substitute word for this. Does that make sense? Okay. But in different parts of the five books, we're going to see Elohim, we're going to see Yahweh in a couple of instances only. We're going to see Adonai, or the Lord, all over the place. 
Um, we're talking about authorship. Um, sometimes you're going to see, though, a problem. The same story is told two different ways. The same person is going to be given two different names. Let me give you two examples. We're going to start next week with the creation. Well, most of the time in your Bibles, it's listed as the creation story number one and the creation story number two. Well, how many times did God create the world? Twice? Maybe, just maybe, it's two different authors explaining God creating the world with two different purposes in mind. And whoever put Genesis together as a book decided to include both of those stories right next to each other. That would imply that there may be two different human authors. Remember we talked about the Gospels last year? What do we say over and over and over again with the Passion and Resurrection narratives? We said that there are, each Gospel is a portrait of who Jesus is for a particular audience at a particular place and time. Right? Remember we said that over and over again. So Matthew is written for a particular audience. John was written for a particular audience. So maybe these versions of creation were written by two different authors trying to explain two different truths about God and where we came from and why he created us. But the redactor, the person who arranged, the editor, if you will, of Genesis, put those two stories together, even though they're from two different authors. Does that make him any less true? Does that make him any less divinely inspired? No. It just means that they put them together. Okay, so how do you explain that if it's one author? Another one. Different, uh, a particular person in two different places has two different names. Um, Moses' father-in-law, the Sheik of Midian, has two different names, depending on which part of the book you're reading. Is that because the author didn't know what Moses' father-in-law's name was? Especially if the author is Moses. <laughs> he didn't know his own father-in-law's name. Maybe... These are two different stories written by two different people about the same guy. This guy was told that his name was this. This guy was told his name was this. And they put the two stories together in the same book because they were stories about Moses' father-in-law, but two different names. Does that mean one's right and one's wrong? No, maybe it just means that this community remembered him as this name and this community as this name. And I don't know. But it, if it was the same author... Wouldn't he use the same name both times? So what we end up having is this. This is the major theory held today about how the five books of Pentateuch, five books of Torah came together. You have four written documents, and somebody sat down and added them into one volume. So you have... The J, because um, Yahweh in Latin, it becomes a J. Um, and in English, becomes a J. But it seems like there was somebody writing in the 9th century. Now, let's put back our thinking caps on. 11th century BC, David is establishing the kingdom in Israel. Right? So now we're in the period of the kings. This is before the exile, before the nation was split, before the Assyrians and Babylonians came along. This is in the time of the early part of the kingdom. And so in parts of the Pentateuch, parts of Torah, you're going to see God referred to as Yahweh. So that's why they call this the Yahweh's tradition, because it seems like that style of writing and the way that guy is storytelling is consistent in different pieces. And so the presumption is that that was all written by the same author the Yahweh's tradition. So parts of Torah are written by this guy. Okay. Eighth century, 100 years later, still right before the Assyrian exile, right before the northern kingdom is taken over by Assyria. Already split. The two countries are split. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Okay. So King David and King Solomon's kingdom is split in two. This is the Eloist, because we see certain parts of the scriptures, there's a lot of the word, use of the word Elohim. Remember we said Elohim means God? So we see a lot of texts 
using this language for God and seems to be there all around the same time period, same writing style. So that's called the Eloist tradition. The Deuteronomist, that sounds like our book of Deuteronomy, right? Seventh century, seventh century is the 600s. What's already happened in the 600s? Remember the timeline? The Assyrian exiles already happened and the Southern kingdom is about to be taken over by Babylon. Okay, so you have people writing in this time and they're writing a lot of laws. Uh, a lot of Deuteronomy is the second set of law. So they're writing a lot of laws and there's a similar writing style and that sort of thing. And then finally the last one, after the exile, post-exilic, so after they come back in 530, whatever I said it was, 539, 532, um, they come back. They're more interested now in establishing the official religion for God's chosen people. So most of this writing is all about sacrifices and the 600 and uh, whatever, 613, I think, uh, tenets of the law. This is all about ritual. This is all about learning how to worship God the way God wants to be worshiped. And so they call this the priestly tradition. Now, the interesting thing is you're going to see snippets of these all over the place. For example, when we get to Exodus, you're going to see this whole question about Moses being circumcised. When you get to Abraham, you're going to see this whole issue about Abraham being circumcised. Most of the scholars say that that was not a normative thing for all the descendants of Abraham until they came back from the exile. So how do you make Abraham a member of the chosen people and Moses a member of the chosen people when they most likely weren't circumcised because circumcision wasn't a thing that happened until after they came back from the exile? So somebody has to go back and write in an explanation how Abraham and Moses can belong to God's people, even though they weren't circumcised. And we'll see in the text how they do that. But this is the priestly tradition writing back into what happened a thousand years ago, 1800 years ago. They're writing that stuff back into the text. So what you're going to see is not a clear, like Genesis was written by the Yahwist and, most, and Exodus was written by the Eloist. You're not going to see that. What you're going to see is... <laughs> Um, an editor who gave us the final version of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which we have today, but they weren't one author just sitting down one day and writing it from beginning to end. There was pieces from here and pieces from here, pieces from here, and pieces from here, and they put them all together into what we have today as Torah, the Pentateuch. Okay, I know that's, that can be a little confusing. It was a lot easier when we talked about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John probably being written by one author. <laughs> This is probably not the case. Doesn't make it any less inspired. Doesn't make it any less important. Doesn't make it any less God's self-revelation to us. It's just understanding this when you get to those glitches and say, okay, well, I thought it was this. And how come it's now it's this? You know, uh, Adam is created on the, seventh, on the sixth day after everything else is created. But now in Genesis chapter 2, Adam's kind of created first and then things are created after that. Which one was it? Well, two different authors are explaining it two different ways because they're trying to teach two different sets of truths. So you take all of it together and you say, this is God revealing himself to us. What is the lessons from Genesis 1? What are the lessons from Genesis 2? Make sense? Um... Literary forms. This is a word you'll see a lot in, if you read about Bible scholarship or if you talk to people who are Jewish, they're going to talk about Tanakh. Tanakh is just a... I, I need to go back. In Hebrew, there's no vowels. If you know that already, that's great. But in Hebrew, there's no vowels. Remember I had said the proper name of God is Y-H-W-H? -H? Did you notice there was no vowels in there? Hebrew doesn't have vowels. Modern Hebrew, they, they put little dots and things around the letters to try and suggest a vowel. But true, real Hebrew has no vowels. So they had to add those two A's. That's why the T, the N, and the K are capitalized. Because usually you would just see the Hebrew letter for T, the Hebrew letter for N, the Hebrew letter for K. But in English, we put the, the A's in there just to make it easier to read. Instead of it, it would be tunk, <laughs> right? So, but they wouldn't pronounce it. The Hebrews wouldn't pronounce it tunk. They pronounce it tanach. <laughs> 
but they just wouldn't write the vowels. They would just write the t, the n, and the k. So we have tor t for Torah, n for the Nevi'im. Remember, there's that plural, im. The Nevi'im is the prophets, and the Ketuvim is the other writings. So there are 46 books in the Old Testament, five Torah, then you got the 12 minor prophets and the three major prophets, those 15 prophets, if I'm counting right. And then the other writings, Psalms and Proverbs and wisdom and uh, the historical books like Joshua and Judges and First and Second King and First and Second Samuel and First and Second Chronicles, all of those others. So it's the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. Interestingly enough, for the real Orthodox Jews, this is the only one that counts. They don't. They don't consider any of the rest of this inspired literature, only Torah. These are commentaries, and these are nice to read, but like even Isaiah, eh, that's just Isaiah. You can believe it or not believe it. That's, that's the Jewish, that's not us, but that's the Jewish people. So Torah is the only one that matters to them. Um, what kinds of literary forms? So when we talk about gospel style of literature, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a biography per se, but it's a collection of sayings and deeds of Christ. There's different styles of literature, obviously, in the Old Testament, too. Even in Pentateuch, you're going to see law. You're going to see history, genealogies and such. Rituals, lots of rituals. Myth. Myth doesn't mean it was made up. Myth means it's a story trying to explain a truth. Okay? So it's not a matter of whether it was made up or not that matters. It's the truth that matters in a myth. Just like a fable, like if you read Aesop's Fables, is it about the crow that could actually, you know, drop pebbles into a bottle or whatever? No, because it's about the fact that you're trying to learn that persistence pays off or the ant and the grasshopper or any of these fables, right? These myths work the same way. It's not about whether, the, whether or not the donkey actually talked. It's about, it's about what the truth is trying to be communicated. Is that Yes. Oh, yeah. We had the one just uh, with the, um, the landowner and the people who started early in the day and the people who started late in the day. People want to start asking questions like, well, what was wrong with those people that were standing around all day? It's like, that's not the point of the parable. <laughs> it may be an interesting question for us to know, but that's not the point of the parable. The point of the parable is the mercy of the landowner. And so parables, you're not supposed to... My favorite example of this is not from scriptures, but from outside scripture. Everybody knows the TV show Gilligan's Island, right? Okay, so whose boat was it? Skipper's, right? Who was his first mate? Gilligan. Those two guys in every single episode had the same exact outfit on. Skipper, blue shirt, white pants. Gilligan, red shirt, white pants, right? But the people who were on a three-hour cruise on somebody else's boat had a different outfit every episode. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Howell had a whole trunk full of money and the teddy bear and all this other stuff. And it's like, wait a minute. But you're not supposed to ask those questions because those are not the point of the show. Okay? So same thing with parables, same thing with myths. We sometimes want to get know the answers to some of those things because we find them interesting, but that's not the point. So you got to remember, myth is not just a made-up story. Myth is saying there's something to happen. We're, gonna we're trying to explain the truth, and don't get caught up in the details that don't pertain to the, the truth we're trying to explain. Saga, Exodus, right? Uh, legend, short story, there's narratives, um, and then this person said this, and then that person did that. And so there's lots of um, different types of literary styles in these, it's just even in these five books, let alone the whole of the Old Testament. Uh, again, two things you'll see, three things you'll see here if you, um, if you get into reading scholarly things. You'll hear this term Masoretic text. The Masoretic text is something that happens about 700 AD. A group of very important rabbis get together and they declare what's the official translation of the entire Old Testament, including the Torah, uh, for the Jewish people. So sometimes you'll see that abbreviated with a capital M and a capital T. Um, the Masoretic text is just telling you that this was the approved version that scholars sat down 700 years after the birth of Christ and said, this is the official version. We have the same thing going on. The 70, that's LXX 70, Septuagint, that means the 70. Uh, th these are people who were 200 years before Christ, who were looking at the 46 books that we call the Old Testament, 
and saying, okay, which 46 are sacred scripture? Which, 40, which versions of the 46 are the right versions? That sort of thing. So that's very important for us because this is one of the things that separates a Catholic understanding of the Old Testament from a Protestant understanding of the Old Testament. Um, we go by the Septuagint in the Catholic Church. So this was the scriptures at the time of Jesus. This is what he would have considered the Old Testament, those 46 books. That's why we consider those 46 books the Old Testament today. So that's called the Septuagint. And then finally, the Vulgate. Um, St. Jerome, whose feast day was just a few days ago, um, was, was charged by the Pope to take the Greek Old Testament and translate it into Latin because by his time in the fourth century, nobody spoke Greek anymore. Everybody was speaking Latin. And so he was charged with translating the entire Bible from Greek into Latin so that people could understand what God is trying to say about himself in their language. And so the Vulgate for, for centuries was the Catholic translation. Every other translation on the earth for Catholics was translated from St. Jerome's Vulgate. So if you had a Catholic Bible in English, the Dewey Reams version, for example, that was very popular in the first part of the 20th century, that was all an English translation of St. Jerome's Latin translation of the Vulgate, which was a translation of Greek and Hebrew texts. So you had Greek and Hebrew being translated into Latin and Latin being translated into English. And remember we talked about translations, how each time you translate, there could be little issues. So... The Catholic Church doesn't go back to the Vulgate anymore. It still respects and esteems the work that St. Jerome did, of course. But we now go back to the original sources. So we go back now to the Septuagint for the Old Testament. Uh, that's the 70. That was 200 and some years before the birth of Christ. That would have been what the, what the chosen people, like Jesus, would have called the Old Testament in their time. Okay, so... The Septuagint is mostly written in Hebrew originally, some of it written in Greek. So when Martin Luther comes along, Martin Luther has a problem with the church selling indulgences, which he should have had a problem with. But he carried it a little too far. He said, not only do I have a problem with indulgences, I have a problem with the idea of purgatory. Well, the idea of purgatory comes from 2 Maccabees. Okay. So, Martin Luther said, well, Second Maccabees, though, that wasn't originally written in Hebrew. It was originally written in Greek. So we don't have to pay attention to that book. We only have to pay attention to the ones that were originally written in Hebrew. So 39 of the 46 books were originally written in Hebrew. And so if you look in a Protestant Bible, there's 39 books in the Old Testament. Okay. Um, but we said, no, at the time of Jesus... There was 46 books in the Old Testament. And Jesus even references things like 2 Maccabees. So if Jesus considers it good enough to be called part of the Bible, so do we. So that's why we have 46 books in the Bible, and most Protestant Bibles have 39 books. Some Protestant Bibles will throw in a separate section at the back with seven, the seven books that we include in the, in the Old Testament that they don't, and they'll call it the Apocrypha. Yeah. Um, so that's when you're looking for a Bible, you always want to make sure if it's got like wisdom and it's got first and second Maccabees and the others, then you know you've got a Catholic Bible. If you don't have those books in there, it's not a Catholic Bible. Interestingly enough, he also wanted to get rid of the letter of James because the letter of James talks about works, not just faith alone. But he couldn't figure out a way to change that. So the King James Version actually changes the text of the letter of St. James to, to, to dance around that issue of. Of, of works making a difference. So interesting stuff. Um, I'm just going to go over this part real fast, but because you're going to you're going to really see all this, but and we're getting close to time being up. Um, the theological significance of the Pentateuch. So why again we talked about why study the Pentateuch, why study the Old Testament. Here's some things that theologically are important for us as Catholic Christians, that come to us from the Pentateuch. The foundational events in theology of the Judeo-Christian tradition, creation, Abraham and Isaac, Jacob and the 12 tribes, um, the Exodus, 
uh, the promised land, the Ten Commandments, the covenants, all of that theologically is so very important to us in, even as Christians. So it's very important. This is where you have the foundational events of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Gives Israel as a people its place in the world. Um, and when you see Israel, there's two ways you can interpret that word too. You could talk about the political entity called Israel, or you could talk about the chosen people. Now, we're part of one of those definitions, but we're not part of the other definition. So we're not living in the nation of Israel, but we are part of the chosen people. We are part of God's people. And so it gives us a history of where we are as a people, as Christians. Uh, Genesis talks about creation, disobedience, God's reaching out to us in salvation, and the stories of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Exodus, we hear about deliverance um, from slavery, not just in a people to another people, but to sin. Co the idea of covenant and God giving us his self-revelation in the law at Mount Sinai. The other books, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, talk about what it means to be the chosen people and a holy nation. A holy nation, that's a very interesting phrase. And the codes of law that they had to follow, some of which we're still bound by. What cultic worship looked like for them. Um, I heard a rabbi once say that we're more, we're more Jewish than the Jews are. Because we still have temples and we still have sacrifices and we still have priests and we still have all these things that the Jewish people don't have anymore because they don't have a temple anymore. But all the things that we, a lot of the things that we do as Catholic Christians, ritually, you can see in the Old Testament, even in Torah. Uh, the whole idea of what it means to be covenant versus a contract, that's, that's huge, and that's present. Um, so you see a Torah, you see promise, cult, rebellion, and redemption, and tradition. So you see all these things coming to us. So understanding Pentateuch, understanding Torah, really, really helps us understand our own Christian faith so much better. The slide you're waiting for. Where do we go from here? So, um, if you turn to uh, the fourth page in your book, I believe. So you have the cover page, you have the table of contents, you have an introduction, I think it'd be helpful to read the introduction. Then you see the, um, the fourth page, lesson one. So this is just some commentary to help you. You know, notice the very first thing it says, read Genesis one through 11. Okay, now, I'm going to tell you, some of these chunks of reading are going to be big. But there's no other way to do Torah in 10 weeks than to have big chunks of reading. So do the best you can. Some weeks you're going to have time to do it all. Sometimes you're not. Do the best you can. The more, the more you're able to read it, the more you're going to get out of it. Um, the, the commentary, the next thing there, is my brief summary <laughs> in two pages or less of those 11 chapters, okay? Just kind of, yeah, yeah. it's like, yeah, how do, you, how do you summarize 11 chapters of Genesis in two pages? Um, it's, it's just kind of giving you an outline of what to look for, what's important in those 11 chapters. So that's, um, I, would, I would encourage you to read that if you have, if you, especially if you don't have time to read the 11 chapters. At the, at the, when you turn the page, on the bottom of the page, Last time we had questions that were mixed in together. Some were self-reflection, some were for the group to share. I divided them out this time to make it a little easier. So you have the questions for discussion in your group when you come for the small table, you know, the, the table discussion. Um, and then you've got um, the, um, some questions for personal reflection, okay? So when you come next time, I'll have a presentation for you. Probably have some slides and stuff again. Um, and then we'll, like we, like we did last time, and then we'll break into groups to discuss the questions uh, for the table discussion. And then um, the other questions are for your own self-reflection. So if you're a journaler, that's a great opportunity to take those questions, do some journaling, or if you just want to pray with those questions, those are for you. Okay. Any questions? I should probably get back here. I'm off camera. <laughs> Any questions on anything? Bob. Is there some JEDB, you know, is there pushback? I mean, you had John last year that's pretty hot. He seems to poo poo a lot of 
Right. So just like, just like last time we did the, the Gospels, we talked about the two document four source theory. These are explanations. They're theories. Because there's nobody anywhere that says, I was there. I know who wrote this. Okay. Um, there's nobody who says, there's no, nowhere in the text does it say who wrote it, on what day, what parts did they write. There's, that doesn't exist for any of the scriptures. Okay. So there's different theories. So for at least a thousand years in the Catholic Church from, <coughs> well, at least 500, from the 1500s to, the, to Vatican II, um, nobody asked the question, who wrote the Pentateuch? Who wrote Torah? It was just assumed Moses did. Okay? So Moses wrote about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, what was going through their minds, even though he wasn't born until 600 years later. Okay, maybe that's divine inspiration. Um, so some people will say, the, also the other thing that's interesting, like in the mass for those 500 years, we never read from the Old Testament, never. There was one reading before the gospel and it was always from St. Paul's letters or maybe one of the other letters. And the gospel almost 90% of the time was from Matthew. We never read from Mark, Luke, or John. Okay, so what did most Catholics know about? St. Paul's letters and the Gospel of Matthew. And so the church said, you know what? God reveals himself to us in all 73 books, not just, you know, 15. So we need to start studying and understanding more about these other books and what they have to say to us about God too. And so you come to a conflict, like I said earlier, about Moses' father-in-law's name. How do you explain that? Well, you can explain it that the guy who wrote it didn't pay attention and made up a name here and they made up a different name there. That's one explanation. You can say that two different people wrote it. You can say that maybe in this community he was known as this name or in this community he was known as this name. So there's different theories about why those two names are used, right? So there are some people who want to say that, nope, for 500 years we said it was Moses. We're just going to keep saying it was Moses and we'll promote the arguments that say it was Moses. Then you have other people and say, yeah, but those arguments don't satisfy me. And so they come up with other theories. The truth of the matter is, we don't know. And anybody who tells you that they do is making it up. Okay? So I gave you the theory that I was taught in seminary, the theory that most Bible scholars hold to. But there are some people, like Scott Hahn, who will say, no, it was Moses and he wrote all five books. Interestingly enough, at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses dies, and there's a few verses after that. So how did he write those verses when he was already dead? Okay. Again, could he have written them before he died? Sure. It's a theory. It's, it's, a, it's a tested theory. It's a scientific theory. But so is the Moses one. And so you can believe whichever one you want to believe. Um, I, I tend to buy into more of the four-source theory because it explains a lot of things. Like, why, why in some places is he called Elohim all the time? In other places, he's called Adonai all the time. Um, different styles of writing. Like, you look at St. Well, that's going to New Testament. Different styles of writing, different emphases. You know, what, this person's emphasizing law and ritual. This person's emphasizing narrative. Is it because this guy cared about law for some reason? This guy cared about narrative for some reason? Could be. Is it because this guy said, well, I've written about narrative for a while now, so I think I've switched to laws now for a while? Could be. We really don't know. It's, they're both good guesses and have good reasoning behind them. Is that a satisfactory answer? Yeah, it seems like more and more people are coming out against some people are against the more conservative. Yeah. It's, I think that it's, my personal feeling on it is that there's a lot of piety behind the Moses argument. There's a lot of wanting to hold to tradition wanting to rebel against something that they feel is a rebellion against. Um, I think there's a lot of that to it. Uh, that's my personal feeling. After I'm not an expert on the scriptures by a long shot. I've studied a lot of these things. But, um, and so the reality is, is there's good reasons to believe in either one, and there's some not so good reasons to believe in either one, and you can pick which one you want to believe. But I tend to, I tend to lean towards the JEPD. Any other question? Good question. Helen. Yeah, so James says, you show me your faith, I'll show you my works. 
Martin Luther was rebelling against this idea because of the whole selling indulgences thing, was rebelling against this idea that you can buy your way into heaven, that somehow you can do works and save yourself. That's called the Pelagian heresy. And the Catholic Church has always been against Pelagianism, sometimes officially and sometimes not. But we've always been against Pelagianism. Augustine fought against Pelagianism as, as a heresy big time. So this idea that your works earn you salvation. No, Christ's work on the cross earned us salvation. Our works show our participation in that salvation, but they don't save us. St. James doesn't say the works save us. He says our works are rooted in our faith. Our faith is lived out in our works, and our works show that we know we've been saved. Right, right. But because Martin Luther was so against this idea of works being related to salvation, he said, sola fide, faith alone saves you, which is true. Faith alone saves you, but you can lose that salvation by not doing the things God is calling you to do. Okay? So he wanted to get rid of that passage in James, but he couldn't use the same argument that he used for the Old Testament. Well, these weren't originally written in Hebrew, so we, they were written in Greek, so we don't have to pay attention to those. So he didn't, he couldn't throw James out of the Bible. So the letter of James is still in all the Protestant Bibles. But the versions of the King James Bible that I've seen changed that text a little bit to try and gloss over this idea that works matter. Um, I don't know if the most recent versions, if they've changed that back or not, I really don't know. But I, I'd seen passages from the King James version of the Bible, which was not written by Martin Luther, but it came out of the Protestant Reformation. Um, so that's this idea of, of, of works and salvation and, and what Martin Luther thought about it. You know, Martin Luther had a lot of, at the beginning, he, he was right on. We should be against selling indulgences. We should not think that our works save us. The problem with Martin Luther is he carried it too far. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't listen to the authority of the church. If he had stopped, he might, we might be calling him St. Martin Luther today. But he didn't. That's my, that's my theory on Martin Luther. I probably, I just said that on, on camera. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll give you St. Martin Luther. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, Susan, any announcements, anything? Okay. All right, then why don't we, yep, we'll just finish with prayer then. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and loving God, we thank you for loving us so much that you want to reveal yourself to us. We thank you for the Holy Scriptures that show us your love, that show us how to be, respond to that love and how to be community, the followers of Christ Jesus, the body of Christ. We ask you to continue to be with all of those who are studying these Scriptures. Help them to open up their minds and hearts to understand your will and your, knowledge, and your, your self-revelation. We ask you, Lord, to grant them patience and peace as they um, struggle through the things that maybe they don't understand um, and give them uh, a teacher who can maybe help clear up some of those questions. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Pray for our children being confirmed tomorrow night. <laughs>